Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome back to a special edition of the e Discovery Channel here with uh, uh, Rocky Messing, who's uh, visiting us in the country these days, staying with your brother in, in Townsend. In Baltimore. Yep. Yeah. Well, you yep. say Baltimore. It's really Townsend, isn't it? Not Pikesville, actually. So, oh, there you go. See? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Baltimore County. Yeah. Yeah. Baltimore County. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so. And uh, we're we're really really pleased to be joined by uh, Judge Paul Grimm. I'm, I I don't think I need to introduce you for anybody who doesn't know <laughs> or has been in a coma yeah. for the last twenty years. Uh, uh, this judge just retired at the beginning of this year, as he noted as we were talking just beforehand. He had an entire day uh, uh, of unemployment, uh, which probably coincided with New Year's Day, right, Judge? <laughs> yeah. yeah wrapped up uh was it 10 years as as a as a judge district yeah, 26 judge? years total 16 yeah. as a magistrate so, judge and 10 years as a district judge. 10 years as a district judge and then 16 as a magistrate uh and he was sitting in the uh u.s district court for the district of maryland but in the chambers in greenbelt maryland um and uh then transitioned literally within a day uh <laughs> to uh being the uh david f levy professor of the practice of law and the director of the Bolsh Judicial Institute, both at the Duke Law School. So uh, uh, welcome, Judge. Thanks for taking some time uh, to talk to us. And really, what I uh, what I wanted to ask you about was uh, tell to tell us about um, the, the Bolsh Institute and what's going on there. What you how did you come to to take yeah. that over? And and that that's sure. what. That's what I want to hear. I, I want to hear a little bit. Yeah. About, how how did know, that occur? Yeah, yeah that's, that's actually an interesting story. Um, all right. So my my plan had been all along uh, that when I reached the uh, number of years of service as a U.S. district judge and, um, and my age coincided with what is known as the rule of 80s, um, as long as you're at least 65 years old and the total sum of the number of years you have been a district judge and your chronological age equals or exceeds 80, then you could take a status which is called senior status. Ah. And you can continue to be on the court, essentially work for free because you don't have any more money okay, for doing hey, it, right. <laughs> uh, and, but take a reduced caseload. And, and that had always been sort of my, my expectation. Sorry, are you saying that they expect judges to do math? Well, yeah, oh, that's, that's, a clerk that's, that's, what yeah that's, right. that's exactly right. Oh, okay. uh, Good. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I could have quit. Your problem, judges, you didn't read a fine print. Um, right. But um, what uh, what happened was um, in 19 or in 2014. Well, let me take a step back um, in, in 2007. A, a very well-respected, nationally prominent U.S. district judge by the name of David Levy, who was then the chief judge of the Eastern District of California, um, sent a letter out to every federal judge. I got it and looked at it. And among the things he said was that he was leaving the bench. Um, he had enough years, but but his age was too young to to um, actually retire to assume the position of the dean at Duke Law School. Uh, and he did that and he served for 10 years as the dean. Um, he was a remarkably effective dean um, and, and David had a vision. And that vision was that um, the uh, higher education in law needed to have a place where you could bring together judges, state and federal and international, by the way, um, the top scholars um, and lawyers and bring them to the same place and have them focus on issues where uh, there were pressing issues, issues of the day um, in, in the topics that were most important to the judiciary and to the country. Uh, and out of that, you could get um, some good would come from that. <coughs> He initiated a series of programs as he was dean, and one of which was to have a uh, a judicial LLM program. Now, when you get your basic law degree in the United States these days, it's a JD, Juris Doctor, um, and then a degree higher than that if you is a, is a LLM, Masters of Law. 
So what they did was he he found uh, a, a the, the funding was provided for to test this out, and they had a uh, an LLM program where they invited uh, state, federal, and international judges to apply. Um, and the way the program was configured was that it would it would be a four week consecutive period of time in the summer, two summers in a row. You would take a series of classes that were designed to sort of broaden uh, a judge's background and education in many, many different things that would relate to being a judge. Um, and then after that, you would write a thesis that was um, uh, of quality to be published, and then you would get a degree. I was applied for and accepted in the second class. So I started in 2014 and a grad program because you're taking an entire semester of academic work in in four weeks and so you are you are hauling right um but the professors are brilliant and they're wonderful and the, you know we had 10 federal judges and 10 state judges and two international judges and you've got this remarkable group of people who are all together and it was just fabulous um so graduated from that that's how i knew about duke and and um, a couple of years later, um, the the um, Carl and Susan Bolch, uh, Carl was a uh, graduate of Duke Law School and Susan is a graduate of Georgetown Law School. And, and Carl um, uh, went into business after he graduated. And he um, is the uh, he was the uh, the owner, CEO, and she was a general counsel for a company called Racetrack, which is a very big, um, uh, particularly down in Atlanta and down south, series of rest stations on international highways, oh, yeah. uh, interstate highways, um, where they have, you know, convenience store, they have, um, um, they have services and everything. And he turned it into uh, this enormous, um, huge and very successful business. But because they were both lawyers and because they believed that their um, financial success as business people was supported by the fact that we have the rule of law in this country, which is necessary for private property to be protected and and uh, people to thrive, that they wanted to create a judicial institute that would um, foster a couple of things. Number one, promote judicial independence. Uh, number two, um, would um, promote uh, judicial education and training. Uh, number three, uh, civic education for the public to become aware of what judges do and what the judiciary does. Um, uh, and that it would come up with initiatives and programs and classes and publications um, that would address these things both domestically and across the United States. Now, as part of this, um, as, as a way to recognize the kind of uh, uh, members of the legal community who have made significant contributions to this, uh, the Bolch Prize was given every every year. Uh, the first one was Justice Kennedy when he retired, um, and we've had a series of of uh, prize recipients every year. Uh, and this is done to sort of highlight someone whose entire career has been dedicated towards strengthening the rule of law. Um, because without the rule of law, without laws that must be obeyed and governed and consequences if they are not obeyed, um, without government being subject to law, um, then there can't be any protection of fundamental rights or property rights or religious beliefs or any of those things that, that we sort of hold as fundamental to what's going on in, in our country and what it was founded to stand for. Um, in recent years, of course, we've seen a tremendous amount of challenges to the rule of law, both domestically, um, and, and that's for a lot of different reasons, not least of which is international purposeful misinformation that has been disseminated by um, uh, uh, you know, foreign states and by other actors trying to um, undermine the public's confidence in what judges do. Um, and internationally, it's happened as well. Rocky in Israel, you know, the, there's there's a huge controversy associated with some some bills to yeah. really uh, strip the judiciary, and and it was heartening. I mean, beyond heartening when you you had 
by various reports, half a million to 750,000 people took to the street and shut the damn thing down because they said, this is a wrong, this is wrong. And now I understand that they're trying to, to reenact them and we'll see where that goes. But that's an example that even- right. elect- and, and that's 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 just specifically there, that that's, uh, it's tricky because almost everyone agrees there that some type of reform needs to take place. You need to modernize the judiciary. Sure. And I think that's, that's part of what, what, you know, you're, you're trying to do is make sure that the judiciary is in taking into account things that are, are relevant to the modern era. Um, but the question is, how do you do it? And how do you do it in a way that doesn't undermine the actual power that is needed by the judiciary for the balance of power? So. Exactly right. And the balance of power, including checks and balances, which means that each branch is accountable to other branches, because exactly. if a branch is only accountable to itself, it's not accountable to anybody. Exactly. And so that's the mission. And we've seen it, you know, in Poland, there have been these pushbacks in Turkey, there's been these pushbacks, Hungary has been these pushbacks. And the lesson that we've learned is even in elected democracies, people can be persuaded through whatever means cause people to vote for whoever they vote for to stand to vote for autocrats, people who do not respect the various institutions that that protect everyone in the country and are supposed to provide accountability. And this is sort of very important because we, we the, the first thing you have to keep in mind is that um, the rule of law is sort of a, a very complex um, group of thoughts, philosophies, ideas, and constructs, but it kind of works in, in a simplified way, this way. You've got branches of government. You've got the, the executive, you've got the legislature, and you've got the courts. They exercise power that affects the people. Um, and inevitably, given a diverse society that people live in, something that each of these branches does, some segment of the population is going to say, well, we don't like that. That's wrong. We're going in the wrong direction. And and um, and but they still have to be willing to say, but we're bound by it. I mean, we don't like it. We want it to change. But that's the law I got to comply with. I am obligated to comply with it until such time that I can vote for someone to change the law or to appoint another judge. Or in many states, the judges are elected, vote for a, a different judge. And the theory is that as long as the people believe that the institutions have integrity and that their voice collectively expressed can change the direction away from an outcome that they don't agree with, they can accept that for the time being, they're bound by it. And that way, if you, you know, to, to give some examples, but without specifics, you know, if you uh, an election comes out some way you don't agree with, you say, all right, it's time to go back. And we got four years to try and change the next election. Um, you got a governor who you don't like, who passes, you know, COVID restrictions and you don't like COVID restrictions. You can vote for a different governor. When you have a, a state court judge that, that, you know, appears on court TV being disrespectful to members of the community, you can vote that judge out in those states where they elect their judges. Um, and in the federal system, um, you know, the president, you could vote for a president who promises to appoint judges who have a certain judicial philosophy. And that fine balance is required. What we see more recently through a lot of complicated factors, not any one factor. We start with um, the fact that the polls have shown recently a rather dramatic, the, 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 the courts were always the branch of government that were the high, the highest um, respect reflected by the public in the courts. That has started to change. It's still more than the elected branches, but it has changed dramatically. Um, and in the last couple of years, it's changed especially so. Um, research has been done by a number of organizations and uh, public opinion polls show that the views of the public towards the Supreme Court have particularly been under stress in the last couple of years. And that as the public views the Supreme Court as a whole, they tend to view the entire judiciary as a whole. The problem is, is that um, the overwhelming majority of people in this country 
know virtually nothing about the legal system. Um, they don't have any contact with it. Maybe they serve on a jury and maybe, God forbid, they're charged with a crime or something. But beyond that, you know, they may get, they may have a, uh, a child that goes into juvenile court or they may get a divorce. But beyond that, they don't have any contact with the judiciary. And on a day to day basis, they don't spend much time at all thinking about what judges do. They just don't because they don't have any contact with it. Now, it used to be that civic education was part of a secondary school education. And they would spend time looking at, at you know, the, the branch of governments. This is the courts. This is how they operate. Um, Just a and, basic fundamental understanding. Exactly. Yep. But what, what the recent data is, is that um, for every, if you take all the federal uh, educational dollars, uh, there's a woman who, uh, Suzanne Spaulding, who was a former uh, high executive in the security industry and uh, in, in, in Homeland Security as an attorney, and she's got a foundation that that focuses on some of these things now. And she came to Duke and was speaking to our our uh, Judge LLM program. And if you took all the federal dollars for education and you figured out where all those dollars went, that there was like five, excuse me, fifty dollars per student per year spent on STEM courses, science, technology, engineering, math. And there was five cents spent on civic education. Wow. So what's what's happened is, is that the public doesn't know what our system is. So how do they learn about it? Well, they're not learning about it in school. That's something we want to try and change. <clears throat> well, where do they look? Media. Where do people get their information now? When I was young, um, you went to, you know, when when Huntley and Brinkley came on or when, when um uh, you know, uh, you had some of those newscasters and they looked at you and they said, this is what happened. You believed them. And now from a result of a lot of things, the, 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 the um, hyper politicization of everything, the, the gridlock in the elected branches, um, social media allowing uh, very uh, misleading or inaccurate information, um, you have a whole series of platforms that are producing information, much of it not accurate or true or even balanced. Right. You've got um, the overwhelming majority of Americans getting their information not from uh, traditional news sites, but from various social media posts. And some of them may be um, posts that are fictitious by foreign um, uh, countries trying to influence and undermine respect for our institutions in this country. Um, and so you've got a whole lot of uh, 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 inaccurate, incorrect noise out there. You have an, a hyper um, polarized country. Um, and as a result of that, you know, you get people's respect for government institutions in general, but now increasingly so for the judiciary are suspect. So if an indictment comes out uh, then the, the 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 press doesn't report that the prosecutors convinced a group of jurors from the community to find that there was probable cause to charge. That's the protection the Constitution gives against the prosecutor just deciding to charge someone. Uh, when there's a trial that results in a conviction, that doesn't report that 12 members of the community that were screened to make sure that they could be fair and impartial found beyond a reasonable doubt that these charges had been had been committed um, and proved. And none of that gets reported. Instead, what happens is you get, it's politically motivated, it's a biased judge, you know, attacks on individual judges are on the rise. Um, and judges can't fight back. I mean, we can't get on there and we can't say, well, I want to respond to that. They can't do it. They had their only, I mean, what, one, on my one day of retirement, when I woke up, I realized my my First Amendment rights had been restored and I could speak about this. You can actually say whatever you want. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. And, um, and as a result of that, um, you know, part of what we're trying to do is to is to increase civic awareness. Um, you know, the 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 uh, animosity towards the Supreme Court, you, you, instead of a, a newspaper a newspaper article that says, look, there's no surprise <laughs> that the Supreme Court issues these rulings that affect people. Only the toughest cases get there. You know, that it's not the routine number of cases. 
the right. hardest issue, the one where the underlying courts cannot agree, that are the most controversial, you know, um, are the ones that get there. Uh, interpretation of laws. There's no one way to look at how law. People say, well, why don't you just follow the Constitution? <laughs> I say, look at the Constitution. And it says that it doesn't say that searches and seizures, all it says about them, it doesn't require that there be a warrant. It just says that they be reasonable. Well, you ask a you ask a narcotics detective what is reasonable, and you ask a drug dealer what's reasonable, you're going to get two different <laughs> views about what's a reasonable search. And they're both yeah. citizens with with rights. Yeah. They might be doing something illegal, but it's still you have you have to have a structure there to, right. to go by. And so, as a result of that, what what you end up with is the most difficult and challenging decisions that are out there. Um, then. You know, people say, well, you know, why doesn't uh, the chief justice just get up there and give a speech? Well, he can't because virtually everything that people would want him to give a speech about is something that the court might have to rule on. And he can't do that. And then they and, and then they tend to forget that this is not a guy who's playing golf every Saturday and Sunday. He's he's not only a Supreme Court justice that has to decide cases. But he also is the chief justice that decides who writes the opinion. So he has to monitor and administer the um, the Supreme Court itself, like a chief judge would do any court. And on top of that, he is the head judicial officer of the entire judiciary of the United States. So he's got three full time jobs that he's doing that are the hardest subjects that are out there um, among a, a, a group of other colleagues who are very smart and uh, disagree upon certain items, um, but they're trying their hardest to try to rule the way they say. And unlike um, certain branches of government that never have to really explain their real motivation, judges have to do it. They right. have to write their opinions. And the test is over time to sustain the test of time. It's not like they're hiding their cards. They're, they're dropping that thing out. And so as a result of it, Instead of trying to have this, this discussion that is a mature discussion that allows the American public to have faith in this institution, that all the difficult issues that come forward have to be resolved by. And let me give you an example of this. Um, the opioid crisis. Everybody's heard a lot about the opioid crisis. It was just astonishing, the, the number of people, lives, cities, counties, municipalities that were affected by that. Um, there has been no legislation effectively trying to deal with the consequences of the opioid. But what there has been is uh, multi-district litigation where lawsuits have been brought against various individuals and pharmaceutical companies on that. Why would you expect that when there are policy decisions to be made, what should be the way we do it? How is the best way to do that? How should drugs be regulated? How should they be advertised? All those are for the legislature. But when you have a legislature that will not legislate because it's paralyzed, then you have disputes and they go to the courts. You're asking the courts to do things they weren't designed to do, but they don't have, judges don't have the luxury of saying, oh, wow, I can't decide. Right. So they have to decide. And so we're in this situation now where the men and women who constitute the United States judiciary are some of the most incredibly hardworking people I have ever seen. I know that because I was one for 26 years. I worked seven days a week um, as hard as I could with a crushing caseloads. Um, and I can now say these things that these judges, you know, it's like it's a real tough guy that takes shots at someone who can't respond in turn, right? <laughs> and so my my notion is, is that we're trying to do things at this institute to, to bolster support for the judiciary, help the public to understand it, because the minute you deteriorate the rule of law and the minute it no longer applies, I don't believe in the outcome of that election. That's not my president. I don't believe in that ruling, so I'm not bound by it. Whenever that happens, there is no law. And the notion of the rule of law is that government, those who wield power, must be accountable. And if there's no accounting, because there's no finality in what the law does, 
and a group of individuals who are selected for their experience, their dedication, their education to do that. Now, people will say, well, you know, judges are appointed through a political process. That's true. Uh, they have political beliefs. That's true. But I've never seen a group of individuals, and I've looked at, I've dealt with state judges, I've dealt with federal judges. Uh, I've never seen a greater group of individuals that try harder to park their personal beliefs personal. Yep. at the door and to decide based upon the facts and the law. And guess what? They have to show their work. They have to explain it. If they make an error, there's an appellate court that can step in and do it. So there's a process that is fair and is designed to protect everyone. And when that process is perceived as not applying to everyone, or when you can simply say, I disregard the, the, the outcome of that, then what you have done is you've started to fray the very fabric of the rule of law itself. And you cannot have a democracy of the type that we believe in without the rule of law. Yep. And so these are the issues that we try to focus on. Um, and um, I'm not saying they're easy. I'm not saying that they're ready solutions, but you know, you, 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 it's better than sitting around and um, what is it, complaining about the darkness or lighting the candle? You try to yeah. light candles. So how so, do you get that it, word out, Judge? I mean, uh, papers, conferences, webinars. You know, how how do you counter the the plethora, if you will, of misinformation that's out there on the internet? Yeah. So if I had the answer for that, man, <laughs> well, that's I'd, be on, a beach, I'd <laughs> be on a beach somewhere drinking a drink with an umbrella in it. Um, I, I think it's just that you have to try. First of all, you need to make people aware of it. How do we do that? Well, we have our judicial LLM program. So we have judges coming in. We're always working with them. We do seminars for judges. We have two publications, Judicature. Um, and you can look at it online you can access it free. It goes to every federal judge and every state appellate judge. Many law firms buy it. Comes out three times a year. Uh, it's, it's in a very uh, engaging format. And we talk about these topics there. We have an international version of it, international judicature. Uh, we have seminars we have. We have podcasts that we put out. Um, and, um, and we have these um awards that we issue and they are platforms for discussing these important topics um and uh and those are the kinds of ways in which you do it now the problem is um um tom you're you probably would remember someone remember back in the 70s there was a canadian philosopher media philosopher his name was marshall McLuhan. sure the medium is the and message. That's exactly right. The medium is the message. And that's that's one of the challenges that we have now. Um, we have to recognize is that the that the American public gets its information differently than it did 30 years ago. Um, you know, we don't have a Walter Cronkite that everybody just automatically has uh, has has uh, faith and confidence in. And so we have to try to get messages that are true honest messages, but we have to do it in the venues where people who are uh, capable of having an open mind can be reached. And that's that's really what the big issue is. So for example, one of the things that we're looking at is, um, um, you know, in, in business, they've done content marketing analysis forever. Uh, and you find out, you know, what what the public is listening to and, and you try to get people the public will listen to uh, and you try to put the message out there and back it up with information that can support it. That is honest information. Um, if you're looking at a very important segment of the American public, 18 to mid thirties, who you really want to be engaged in the legal system or in the judicial or, or in the, in the system democracy by voting um, a lot of them just turn their back on it. But if you at, find out where they're getting their information you know, they're not getting it on CNBC or on Fox News. They're getting it on Instagram or TikTok or Google. Um, and you can actually design searches 
where, and we've done this, where you can go on Google and find out what are the questions that are most often asked by people who Google questions about the American judicial system. You can design programs that deal with that in, in content, which is engaging. You know, it could be like a, like a YouTube or a TED talk or a video, or, you know, it could be a cartoon. I mean, there's some really neat educational programs that folks, folks have come out with. There's one that's the the murder trial of SpongeBob SquarePants, which yes. is <laughs> designed to help, you know, grade school kids understand how the criminal trial works. Um, you know, so you can get creative. And, and what you need is, but you also need to engage people within the community of good faith and, and lawyers particularly. Um, there is the, the legal profession needs to stand up and talk on behalf of judges who do not have the voice to be able to do it because they're not allowed to. And when you get this misinformation, there must be a, you know, there must be a, uh, a willingness on the part of the, 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 the profession that most understands how it operates to stand up and to say through whatever platforms that can be said that will be reached, uh, that will reach the American public that's not right. That's not fair. That's that's wrong. And here's why it's wrong. Not just my opinion, but my opinion backed up by by reasoning. Um, and and, you know, I, I, I no one has the key plan for all of the things that have to happen. And frankly, there aren't the resources that any one organization has to do it. But many resources. You mean in many six months you haven't been able to figure all that out and get solve it all it. right? I mean, come on, you're a judge. <laughs> exactly right. Well, I I realize that, but you know, and nobody has to pay attention to what I say anymore. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, that's but, yeah. No one has to, but they will, and they are, and, and that's that's the important thing. It is well, and that's one of the things we wanted to yeah, do was to exactly to, to have exactly. you articulate those yeah. things so we can put them out there and. And, and try to get people aware of this. It, it, we need better. We were interviewing somebody the other day and he goes, you guys are like a, a laboratory for democracy. Right. <laughs> which we thought was a, a little. Well, you could be called, you could be called worse than that, right? <laughs> exactly. well, and, and we'll, we'll take that. We'll and take have. that. <laughs> Not sure that we are. But yeah. <laughs> I said, I said to Rocky, that makes us sound like a Petri dish, but. You know. <laughs> well, that's all right. Um, <laughs> we could use Petri dishes like that. But we well, got to just I, I, get this out. Yeah. Yeah. And I, well, I'll tell you an example. An example is, is that everybody can do something, but but until 2018, when the Bolches decided to do this and were generous enough to make this happen, this institute didn't exist. Yeah. And 2018 wasn't that long ago. Um, and we have done, and I say this because I've just stepped into it. I mean, I can't take credit for everything that was done before. Um, a remarkable array of programs out there that, that reach a lot of people through a lot of venues. Um, and that's just um, one husband and wife who believe in the importance of the system and were able to have resources to give towards it. Yep. And so if you take that and, and you magnify that by 100,000 or 200,000 people, each giving to that ultimate goal however they can whether it's uh being a host of a podcast or or um writing a letter to the editor when they think that there's something that's been done wrong uh or hosting you know uh yeah. um there, there's all kinds of ways you can do it you can you know go to a community college and teach a civics class where you have a you have a beer and pizza quiz night where you talk about the American judiciary and you give beer and pizza away to people get the answers right. You know, there's 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 a million different ways of doing it. What I have faith out about is I was a judge for 26 years. I had the privilege of presiding over a lot of jury trials. I never had a jury trial where at the beginning of it, any member of that jury wanted to be there. All of them wanted to be somewhere else. I don't want to do this. I'm busy. I got a sick kid. I got to work. Blah, blah, blah. And every one of them at the end of that trial said, I had no idea the system worked this way. This was a this was a, a, a meaningful experience to me. I have so much more faith in the way the system works. And I'm glad I did this. I had people write me letters. Um, and that and, and what that shows is um uh familiar familiarity with what is good about that system 
I know a lot of judges that work 70 and 80 hour weeks. When was the last time you read a story, you know, you know, dedicated judge burns the midnight oil to do their <laughs> best job to rule in there. And let me, let me show you another thing. You think back on any, any movie, novel, TV show, Netflix series right. where the judge is portrayed as anyone other than a complicated in. jerk. Right. Just rolling in the courtroom, you know, usually yeah. with a gun under your robes. Right? Yeah, you're, <laughs> right? you're egotistic, you're you know, you're, 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 yeah. you, you scream at people and you do all those things. And that's just not the way it is. But, you know, that's not what sells. And so right. what we need to do is through every program, every venue, yours is one of them, that you can, you have to have people to realize is that, look, um, democracy doesn't necessarily die because of one catastrophic events, but it can certainly die over Believe. decades of neglect. Yeah. And we're in challenging times now. Um, and and as a people, we hope that that those who are elected to lead us will try to, in good faith, do what they think is best for the country as a whole. It can't be such in a country which is divided 50-50 where everything is zero sum. For me to win, you have to lose. You got to find win-win solutions wherever you can. And, and people have to have faith in the governmental institutions and the faith and the knowledge that if they disagree with what the governmental institutions do, whatever branch it is, that they have they have buy-in to the process to change it. And until that process changes, they are required to respect and to adhere to the, the government um, uh, and actions uh, and enactments. And- I was gonna say, um, be careful with, with how we phrase that because inaction- Inaction, <laughs> in, uh, in Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. So, well, Judge, so, we're well, about out of time here. Uh, 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 once again, I've filibustered you to death. No, no, no. This is exactly <laughs> what we, yep. we wanted to hear is is what your mission is and how you're trying to get the word out. And we hope to help with that. And then, um, you know, we'll go, we'll follow up with you in six months and see if you're quite so enthusiastic. <laughs> right. And if you're, you've gotten to the point where you're just sitting on a beach with a, a with drink a, and yeah. Boat drinks. Yeah. That's right, exactly right. Or no. tossing the uh, tossing the fly rod out there and into the yes, Severn River. Exactly right? right. Listening to the laughter of the fish underneath the water. <laughs> yeah. All right, fellas. Thanks thank very you much, so much for your time. Thanks yeah, again, bye. and uh, we'll uh, see you someplace down the road. And uh, all our listeners will see you again on the eDiscovery Channel. That's great. Thanks so much, guys. Thank yeah. you.